Hello, I'm V.B. Price. I'm the editor of New Mexico Mercury. I'm here today with a longtime friend, neighbor, child advocate, and pediatrician, Lance Chilton, who's written columns for Century Magazine and has been a regular columnist on children's health issues in the Albuquerque Journal. Lance has been caring for kids in New Mexico for over 40 years. Um, he's currently a professor and pediatrician at the Young Children's Health Center in the International District in Southeast Albuquerque. His current medical interests include immunizations, pediatric advocacy, the effects of poverty and adverse childhood experiences on child development, and the care for immigrant and Native American children. We're going to be addressing today the terrible problem of childhood malnutrition in New Mexico and its long-range implications for neurological development, learning disabilities, and other pressing issues. It's an honor and great privilege to have you here with us today in the Mercury Library lands. I've uh, enjoyed our association over almost 40 years sure. and uh, will enjoy talking with you about a, a non-enjoyable subject today. The numbers of underfed and food insecure children in New Mexico are just staggering. Um, could you fill us in on the most recent statistics and uh, generally where in New Mexico these, uh, these children live and what their general conditions are? Well, unfortunately, this is one of those areas where New Mexico ranks at the very bottom among the states in the United States, where we have more food insecure children than almost anywhere in the, in the country. We have, according to the U.S. Department of Agriculture and Feeding America, about 30% of New Mexico children who are malnourished. And according to the Feeding America charts, we have somewhere around 157,000 hungry kids in New Mexico. Now, when I use the word hungry, I'm also using the term food insecurity, and, and I probably should define that yeah. for you and for the the people watching. Um, food insecurity means to the federal government and those who, who track what most of us would call hunger, that during the past year, these children, 157,000 children in New Mexico, have failed at some point to have enough to eat on a regular basis. So 157,000 children, 158,000 children, that's more than the populations of Rio Rancho and, and Santa Fe combined. I suppose if you threw in Espanola and maybe Los Alamos, that would be the, you know, uh, the total number. It's a staggering amount of people. Um, is there, is there a geographical distribution that's uh, peculiar to this group of people, or are they just everywhere in the state? If you look at the map that Feeding America has, there are counties throughout the state where food insecurity is particularly high. Mm -hmm. Luna County, for example, which is um, Deming and the area mm -hmm. around there. McKinley County with Gallup and a large part of the Navajo Reservation. Mm -hmm. um, it's high for some reason in Torrance County and in Guadalupe County in the um, East Mountain area. Right. Huh. Um, but it's really everywhere except maybe Los Alamos County. So when we were talking a while back, we, um, you, you mentioned that early childhood malnutrition, or whatever we're, we're going to call it, has uh, tremendous long-range neurological implications for child development, learning disabilities, and other issues like that. Could you explain that to our audience in some detail? Back uh, in as much as you can as you can do that you think we're going to understand. Well, first of all, I have to say in response to yeah. that that it's what, what I'll be talking about is not the result of uh, controlled experiments. Okay. Fortunately, nobody is, is systematically starving children to find out what the effects will be. And sometimes it's difficult to, to separate the effects of hunger and food insecurity from the effects of other parts of poverty. Right. As New Mexico, as you know, uh, ranks very high in childhood poverty as well. Right. And childhood poverty is associated with food insecurity, but it's also associated with adverse childhood experiences like um, 
like violence, like parents missing, parents being deported, um, parents who don't have the time or the, the inclination to be involved in their children's life. So it's a little bit difficult sometimes to separate those other effects of poverty from the one we're talking about in particular, food mm -hmm. insecurity. Food insecurity is much more common in poor children than it is in any other group of better off children. Um, and so that, that's the caveat in what sure. I'm about to say. Sure. But, um, but it is clear that children who are food insecure have lower development, lower reading scores, um, lower ability to, to access their education. Um, they, uh, they also have a number of other effects uh, which are uh, interesting. They, they uh, may have more difficulty fighting infection. They may, which in turn may cause difficulty with learning if they're missing a lot of school. Mm. Um, and also it, uh, childhood food insecurity is uh, probably counterintuitively associated with obesity in ah. later life. Huh. Could you explain that a bit? Well, I don't think that I can explain exactly why that's the case, but um, because nobody else seems to be able to explain it either whether it's a hormonal basis that, that tells kids that you better eat when you can and, um, and therefore you eat too much, mm -hmm. or whether it's the, that you need to eat more quantity of food to get the, the nutrients that you need. Right. When you don't get enough nourishment as an infant, let's say, um, what actually happens to your neurological system? Again, uh, I'm not sure that I can answer that with any great degree of authority. Um, I'm looking into a black box, but I'm also a black box that's looking into <laughs> that black box. <laughs> and uh, the, the nerve cells that are in my brain um, are similar in number to the number of neurons that are in the brain in an infant. Hopefully the connections that form between my nerve cells, my neurons, um, are well developed so that I'm passing information back and forth from one part of the brain to another. Yes. If I hadn't had enough to eat in the first, uh, well, the, the, the first nine months of my development within my mother um, and then thereafter, it's very likely that I would not have developed those connections to the degree that um, enables me to carry on a conversation with you today. It just never really crossed my mind that um, having food insecurity, which is a very real, real thing. I, I know this from my own experience as a kid, um, would actually have permanent neurological brain damage in children. I, I just, that's just a sobering thought. I know that, that you've been uh, looking into some of the information that's available now about the uh, what happened to children in Nazi-occupied Holland uh, at the end of World War II, where the Nazis um, basically imposed famine on a large part of the country in retribution for their help with it, uh, with the Allies. Um, could you tell us a little bit about those findings? Well, I said a moment ago that nobody does studies where they they try to starve children to find out what's, what's going to happen with them. But in effect, that's what the Nazis did in the, the winter of 1944-1945. They imposed famine, not, not in order to do experiments, but rather to punish the, the Dutch for their collaboration and their hiding of Jews and so forth. And so the, the number of calories ingested by pregnant women and by children um, during that time was markedly reduced to below the usual Dutch diet, which was adequate, um, had been adequate, and, um, and below that which would be recommended for pregnant women and for children. So following that, um, as we all know now, um, the World War, World War II ended. Um, the Dutch, again, had a, an adequate diet. And... Um, 
So the, the children and the mothers who had been starved during that period have been looked at ever since, really, wow. to, uh, to find out what might have happened. Um, right, let's see, it would, would have been in the, the 60s that, that the children who were born in 1944 and 1945 would have entered the Dutch armed forces. And there was some evidence, number one, that, that those children were more likely to be obese than children before and after. Um, but more importantly, perhaps, they were more likely to have emotional problems. There was a higher incidence of schizophrenia and the incidence of, uh, of learning disabilities and uh, uh, cognitive problems was increased. So although we're not in a state of of famine, uh, still some 30% of our population lives in, an, in, in conditions that most of us simply really don't comprehend because we eat well. Uh, if 158,000 children uh, are worried about their, about their next meal, if their next meal isn't adequate, for their nutritional needs, they are, in, in some sense, mirroring those conditions in Holland. Not, not certainly one for one, but so those, those stories and those anecdotes and that and those studies are pertinent to us today. Well, I think they are very pertinent to what we're experiencing now. Um, even if they were more extreme. The, the conditions imposed by the Nazis were more extreme than most food insecure children face now in New Mexico or elsewhere in the first world anyway. Um, but to have 30% of, uh, of the children in New Mexico having food insecurity and being subject to the possibility even of cognitive disability of being a, a drag on the society rather than a than something a person who can be part of the society I think that's frightful so if we also have a, a um, and I'm not totally sure we do an educational crisis in New Mexico I, I often wonder if our educational problems aren't politically trumped up but that's that's just the skeptic in me. But still, if we do have a number of, of young people who can't uh, compete educationally, that might be one of the reasons. Uh, malnutrition might be a very real reason that simply, simply sets them up uh, in an interior and, and internal condition that they can't overcome. So the question I want to ask, I guess, really, is are these early neurological problems, let's say, uh, are they permanent? Do they last all of one's life usually, or is there, or is it a little more, a little more uh, vague than that? Again, I think it's a little bit hard to separate out the effects of of hunger per se or food insecurity per se, uh, as compared with the complex of things that go along with poverty. So I think of it as sort of a, of a vicious cycle. Mm. Poverty begets food insecurity, begets not doing well in school, begets poverty, um, mm. lack of job achievement, and so forth, and so on around the, the, the circle. Uh, I think if there's any chance, and I think there's a very good chance, based on the Dutch experience and elsewhere, that hunger food insecurity have a, an effect on economic productivity, to put it crassly, or um, child development and, uh, and human, humanity and human development, then we ought to be putting a lot of effort into doing something about it. Absolutely. Uh, I, I just, it just staggers me that, that a civilized, allegedly civilized society a rich society, a society just brimming over with enormous abundance, could have 30% of its children be poor, be starving. It just doesn't seem, I mean, it's a sin. Um, 
I'm sorry. It, it's just, it just um, tears my heart out. Um, I, I do know, though, that you have also been advocating for a long time uh, on the beneficial properties of breastfeeding. That this particular, uh, that malnutrition can often be put off or indeed um, avoided by breastfeeding. Could you talk about that a little bit? Well, I believe in evolution. I think you do too. I do too. <laughs> uh, and um, I believe that over the however many hundred thousand years there have been humans around, that breast milk has been perfected so that the, the women who make good breast milk are, are those who've, whose descendants have prospered and have raised more children. Maybe once we've had a hundred thousand years of uh, producing infant formula, we'll have as good an infant formula as there is breast milk. <laughs> Um, but um, the, the way we got to this subject when we were talking about this before is that there are studies that show that children who are breastfed have six or seven points IQ improvement compared to those who are raised on formula. Wow. Uh, that's quite an amazing thing if you look at a population. If you move the curve to the right so that, that everybody has a six or seven point increase in their IQ, the, um, again, to put it in crass economic terms, the amount of money we have to spend on special education decreases markedly, and the number of people we have who can make the next Facebook or Twitter, um, or maybe something more important, um, increases. So, even if you're uh, um, a mother in a working poor situation, uh, and you yourself have some food insecurity, your milk might well offset the negative impact of the food insecurity of your child. Yes, I think even in places where people are resource starved, to use that term again, yeah. um, babies are very good parasites. They're able to steal from their mother just what they need in terms of nutrients, even if the mother uh, suffers deficiencies of such things as iron or calcium or other uh, important things that babies need. The movement to uh, to advocate for breastfeeding, uh, and and also I suppose tangentially the movement for uh, to uh, to ensure immunizations across the board in our country, um, uh, really are, are are tremendously important for. For the well-being of young people. I mean, I, mean, I, I really didn't. I mean, <laughs> this is obviously not something I know anything about, but it, it really surprises me that that uh, that that mother's milk can offset those terrible problems uh, to such a degree. Um, I mean, a six a six-point uptick in one's intelligence is a remarkable benefit. <laughs> I'm, I'm pleased that you have paired breastfeeding with immunization. Breastfeeding advocates have called breastfeeding the first immunization. Oh, and uh, they do that not only because of that six or seven point bump in intelligence, but also because uh, children who are breastfed are less likely to get ear infections, less likely to get uh, diarrheal diseases, less likely to get all sorts of infections. So. Oh. It, uh, it works as an immunization does. I think immunizations are terribly important myself, uh, the ones that we inject, but we might as well start by putting it in the mouth with, with breast milk. That's fascinating. I, I, I love that image. Is it, 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 it makes it uh, all seem incredibly clear to me. Uh, I think it's wonderfully said. Um, I wondered if we could sort of um, leave leave the realms of, of, um, of studies and things, and talk a little bit about your experiences with real children. You've been dealing with kids for so long. You must have seen endless, endless things. And I know you can't talk about your patients and all that, but, but are there any sort of general stories that you have that you think would, would illustrate the, uh, the depth of these problems? 
I'd like to tell you about three. Oh, I'll right. tell you three stories. One comes from my second year in New Mexico, 1970-71, when uh, I was taking care of a newborn at Gallup Indian Medical Center. Um, and this was a baby who was born far too early and who had all kinds of troubles. And we took care of uh, at great cost there at the hospital in Gallup, um, with a lot of help from the nurses and lots of visits from the parents and lots of problems. And I did things then to help this baby that I probably wouldn't feel comfortable doing anymore, and I'd leave it to the experts. But at that time, um, I was the uh, sub-expert in charge. So, um, so I took care of this baby really well, I thought, and at a couple months of age, I sent him home, out to the Navajo Reservation somewhere, um, and um, had him come back to see me, of course, to see how he was doing. So after all of this investment of time and money and effort, he came back malnourished a month later. Oh, God. And, um, and probably will have lasting consequences of that. Um, we had put our priorities in the wrong place. We were taking care of, of a child's physical problems without really making sure that when he went home, he would have enough food to eat and, and would thrive. His mother couldn't breastfeed him because he'd been in the hospital so long that her breast milk had dried up and we hadn't provided enough formula for him. So that's one story. Another story that I'll tell you really has more to do with maternal nutrition rather than child nutrition. Every once in a while, um, we see a child who is born without the, the closure of the neurologic system. And I'll explain that for a moment. The neurologic system in a developing fetus closes from the middle to both ends so that there can be an opening left up here in the back of the head or in the, in the lower back, the lower back being the more common. It's a condition called spina bifida, and it's one of those things that I just dreaded seeing when my children were about to be born. They didn't have it. Well, since, since I've been in, out there in the field doing medicine, it has been determined that a large proportion of spina bifida cases, or hydranencephaly, which is the lack of closure up here, are caused by lack of a nutrient in the mother's diet called folic acid. Oh um, and that's something that we can deal with if we make sure that mothers get adequate nutrition. And when they do, the incidence of spina bifida is markedly decreased. So I've cared for a number of kids with spina bifida over the years and have wondered, is that one of those that would have occurred anyway, or is it because the mother was unable to get enough folic acid during, during pregnancy? The third one that I want to mention is probably the most common of all, and that is um, I have, unfortunately, lots of kids who are obese. We have an interesting way of defining obesity, but I'll leave that aside. They're, by any measure, these kids are obese. And many of them tell me that when they were young children, they weren't getting enough to eat. I think of one 14-year-old whom I saw this past week who was telling me about his uh, inability to get food when he was really hungry as a young child. And you'd think that that would make him skinny rather than fat. Yes. And as we said before, I'm not sure why it is that, they, that children who are hungry in early childhood are fat when they get older. But as you know, obesity is a major problem for this society and for most societies around the world. Um, at this point, and will will perhaps lead to this next generation having a shorter lifespan than we've had, and the first time that has ever occurred to anybody's knowledge. I know you have uh, opinions about uh, solutions, and and you've also, I'm sure, I'm sure, thought a great deal about what we can actually do about this. Aside from, I guess a major sociological revolution in America in which wealth distribution is, is a little more equitable and, um, 
and uh, humane values are at the top of the list rather than at the bottom. But aside from those things, are there tangible, immediate things we can do uh, to help alleviate these terrible, terrible conditions for young people? Well, in answering that, I think I first have to um, not accept your invitation to bypass the societal reasons for okay. hunger. Uh, I, I want to say again that most hungry children are poor children. And if we can somehow increase children's economic security, we will increase their food security. Uh, I think that's the first thing and most important thing. Um, yes, we can feed them. Um, but there are all those other effects of poverty that make life very difficult for children and have lasting effects. Um, however, if you, if you talk just about how to get food into the mouths, mouths of babes, um, then we should start by breastfeeding. That's, that's the first thing, the first immunization, the first um, morsel of good food that should be put into children's mouths. And then we should make sure that there are programs where poor children can get the food that they need. There are a lot of experiments that have been done and a lot of ways that the federal government helps with that. Um, the federal government provides the su Supplemental Nutrition Assistance Program, SNAP, um, which um, feeds kids. There's the federal school lunch program and school breakfast program, which are very important, and which mean, by the way, that children are, who are food insecure are more likely to be better off during the school year than they are during the summer. Um, there's the WIC program, the Women, Infant, Children Special Nutrition Program that feeds pregnant women and young infants and toddlers. Um, that's very important. And then there are charitable organizations such as uh, in an Albuquerque Roadrun Roadrunner Food Bank which provide food for people who don't have it for a variety of other reasons. So I think all of those are important. Um, the city of Philadelphia has looked at it, at it from another point of view. They, they talk about food deserts. Yeah. You may have heard of that term. The, um, we don't seem to have food deserts like that in Albuquerque, at least. Um, we, even in the part of the city where I work, uh, where people are poor, um, there are good supermarkets and places where you can get fresh fruits and vegetables. But Philadelphia has shown that by providing foods like that, fruits and vegetables, um, to people living in very poor neighborhoods, they can improve the nutritional level of the children in those areas. So those are just some of the many ways in which it can be done. Um, I. I think of these as investments in children yeah. and in people in general. Yeah. And I hate to see it when, um, when I look at what's happening in Washington with the farm bill right now, yeah. where the Senate wants to cut only $4 billion out of, uh, out of the SNAP program over the next five years, and the, the House wants to cut $20 billion out of the out of, uh, uh SNAP program over that period of time. Um, hopefully neither will get through and they'll maintain funding and hopefully there won't be delinking of assistance for rich farmers from assistance for poor children. Do you imagine that anybody who is willing to cut SNAP or food stamps really has any concept about what it means uh, to working poor families in the United States and working poor families in New Mexico to lose even a, t a small portion uh, of that assistance. Do you think they really understand? Well, this is a country that, that really enjoys the Horatio Alger story, mm -hmm. the rags to riches. But if you look at who's in those seats in the 435 members in the House and the what is it, 100 members of the Senate, um, they're not poor people. They're, most of them do not have a Horatio Alger story, no matter how hard they try. And so I don't think they can appreciate how it is to be poor, how the effects of this um, reach down to children and 
cause long-term effects. So I think it's very important for us as pediatricians and for you as everybody else to make the point that children can't make for themselves, that, that food is important, that poverty is, or lack of poverty is important, and that we need to do something about this. We've done pretty well by the elderly. If you look at the figures um, on hunger in, in New Mexico, for example, only 20% of all New Mexicans are food insecure, only. That's, uh, but compared to 30% of, um, of the population of children, um, that means that we're doing a lot better for everybody else, and we've done a whole lot better for old people since the Johnson Revolution with Social Security and Medicare and so forth. It's time to have that kind of, of effect for children as well. Listening to you today uh, describe these horrendous matters in such clear terms, uh, I, think I, I think I understand uh, in my own self why I want to join the ranks of, of a child advocate. Um, I want to do what I can, and I know probably a great many people do. The more they, the more they understand what exactly this means. I don't think. I mean, I've been in this business and the news business a long, long time, but I never made a connection between food uh, and this is stupid between food and 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 developmental capacity. Uh, to start off with something that can be avoided that can just never happen, well, but almost never happen. With just a few basic changes, it just seems criminal not to make those changes. Thank you so much today. I'm just terribly grateful to have you here, and hope we can have you back and talk about, the, about these matters in different terms and in different forms later on. Uh, I know you've been working all your working life to help children, and they are the, they are the most vulnerable ones. And uh, I'm deeply grateful to you for being here and for doing your work. Thank you, Barrett. The children really need people like you and maybe people like me and the people that I work to train to advocate for them.